Hi, my name's Andy, and uh, this is a video about uh, showing you some examples of where if you change your Java code into Kotlin code, I argue can make your code better. So people have been uh, asking me at work, quite a lot of my work is uh, written using Java. Um, I've been getting into uh, Kotlin, enjoying it, and people have been saying to me, well, isn't it just syntactic sugar? What does it really add? Um, this uh, video is a response to that to try and show that some of that uh, sugar uh, does add good things. So, um, I'm going to talk briefly about what Kotlin is, uh, then I'm going to have to try and convince you about some things that I think are good in programming, um, before you're going to be convinced that Kotlin makes your code good. Uh, and then the main part of it is going to be going through a few examples of um, some real life code that I've found in our code and then mercilessly hacked so it's totally unrecognizable. Um, and what happens when you convert that from Java into Kotlin, uh, arguably make it better. So first of all, what is Kotlin? Kotlin is a programming language. Um, it compiles down to the same thing that Java compiles to, so it, it can run anywhere that a Java program can run. Um, but more than that, it's very compatible feeling with Java. So there's quite a few languages that do work on the Java virtual machine, so they can run anywhere that Java runs, uh, and that uh, can use Java code from that language and you can use um, code in that language from Java but they don't feel very um, Java-like so uh, it's quite unnatural to interoperate between the two things. Kotlin really feels very Java-like. It feels like um, like an incremental improvement on Java rather than a, another language that you then have to work hard to make it work with existing Java code. So um, it's pretty quick and easy to um, gradually move from a Java code base to a code base that's partly Java and partly Kotlin. Uh, and it feels familiar to um, Java programmers, a lot of the way things work, the way things look. It looks the kind of, almost like how you would write Java if you were writing pseudo code Java and you didn't want to bother with some of the more annoying parts. Uh, you can just write Kotlin like that and it works. So sometimes I just guess how I think the Kotlin would be and sometimes I just guess right. Uh, but uh, so it, it feels like Java, looks like Java, but you write you end up writing less code and I argue you end up writing better code. So uh, this video is really focused on that last one. Um, uh, can you write better code? Does your code get better when you turn it into idiomatic Kotlin? So, as I said, if, if I'm going to convince you um, that some of the code I'm showing you is good, I have to talk a little bit about what I think is good, uh, what makes good code, or some of the aspect. maybe not to say if you just got this checkbox then your code is good, but some of the things that make me, some, some of the things I've noticed about code that I like uh, is that they have some of these properties. So one thing I like is separating out uh, code that represents a value or an object that you're working with from code that manipulates it in some way. Um, now you might think that that sounds a little bit like uh, I don't like object-oriented programming and to some extent um, you might be right in thinking that. I certainly think that uh, inheritance um, is wildly overrated and a cause of a lot of unnecessary complexity and difficulty um, in code. Um, I, I mean I do think object-oriented programming can be really good. I think it can be especially good for encapsulating a value that maybe has some complex interaction between the bits of that value but you don't want the outside world to see that or you don't want the outside world to be able to interfere with that. But what I do think is that values generally, um, if you, the way to recognize that maybe this code, look, your code looks a bit like how I'm saying here, is that values tend to not have many dependencies, just be about about the, the value that they're talking about. So something like a complex number or something that doesn't depend on other stuff um, versus uh, an algorithm or a, um, a function or something like that which manipulates values and it maybe does depend on quite a lot of other things that it brings together in order to combine them together or, or um, use the properties of one to manipulate another or something like that. So. Um, you might be following what I'm trying to describe here. If you have simple co classes that represent things and then complicated functions that combine those things together. Maybe. Um, other things that I think are good, uh, immutability. So this means um, stuff not changing uh, or you having very careful control 
of what's going to change and most things are not going to change um, so that you can concentrate on things that might change because things that might change cause complexity um, because when you come back to the next time they might be different. Um, that's true in single threaded code but it's particularly true when you've got multiple threads of execution manipulating things. Um, other things that I think are good um, finding out the mistakes I made as early as possible so in this context finding out about them when I run the compiler instead of when I run the program and I've gone home I'm trying to have tea. Um, other things I like um, declarative style by which I mean uh, in general trying to write code that um, says how things are not what to do to make them how they should be um, because it's a little bit closer to um, how I model problems in my head often so if I can write code that directly expresses um, that understanding of the world I'm more likely to get it right it's more likely to be simpler um, it, it's harder to mess up by just swapping two lines around so that things happen in different order stuff like that um, and also in general if these other properties are already true something that I like uh, something that makes me like code is that there isn't very much of it I'm much more likely to be able to understand it okay so those are some things I think that are good um, something that I think Kotlin gives you is gentle nudges um, which generally make it a little bit easier to do things which I think are good uh, and makes where you've done things that are not so good or hard or more complicated um, they're a little bit more visible um, in the code they're not hidden That's what I sometimes see anyway in some Kotlin code um, so the other thing that I, I think you get from Kotlin is that over the last however many years uh, decades of writing Java We've found some ways of writing code which um, uh, seem to work in, in the Java world, um, patterns that we follow. Um, some of what Kotlin does is take some of those patterns and makes it really easy to follow that pattern instead of having to do a whole load of work just to um, recreate something that you know is a good idea and everyone knows is a good idea and everyone does everywhere. And we'll see a good, a good example of that pretty soon. Uh, so we move straight on to some examples, and this is uh, a picture of British musician example uh, to help illustrate that we're now moving on to some examples. So here's our first example. This um, this object is a value object, and this is um, approximately similar to something I found in our real code at work. Um, so uh, this this um, object represents a thing called thing. It's not really called that in our production code uh, and this thing has two properties it has a name and a desk which of course presumably stands for description um, so it has um, two fields at the top called name and desk it has a constructor that takes a name and a desk and in the constructor it sets name to name and desk to desk it has a getter called get name which returns name uh, notice by the way that um, this this uh, object is immutable so uh, in where possible I've written the Java examples in the way that I like code to be written um, so in this case things don't need to change so this is this thing class is immutable so you, once you've constructed it you know that name is always going to be what you passed in at the beginning uh, other things that this thing class has it has a hash code function uh, now here's a programming problem for you is this hash function correct uh, and while you're thinking about that, you might like to think about uh, whether it's possible to say whether a hash code function is correct. Um, and then here's an, uh, it, the equals function on thing. Now, you don't have to read all that. I made it small to demonstrate there's a lot of it. Um, you'll notice there's some things highlighted in red. Is this equals function correct? Maybe. Um, also, this um, object has a to string method which returns some kind of string representation of this object um, so that was our, our class thing uh, that class has 14 mentions of the word name 13 of them are all lowercase um, one of them is camel case and every time we mention the word name what we essentially mean is this object has a property called name so we say that at the beginning with the um, field declarations and then with the constructor parameters we're saying the same again 
And then with the hash code function where we use name, we're saying the same thing. This object has a property called name. This object has a property called name. This object has a property called name over and over and over again. Um, so this is a pattern that we follow in Java because we found it's a good way of making an object, right? We want to construct it um, for whatever reason we've decided that public fields are bad, um, even if they're final, um, maybe because you can still mutate them. I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, so this is a pattern that we've um, we found, and we know that we need a hash code function whenever we've got a uh, equals function, and we know that uh, to do testing in a nice way, you often need an equals function. So we often end up writing this stuff. You also uh, need a two string function because it makes your um, error messages on your test assertions look better. So you end up writing all this stuff. Um, the Kotlin code for an exactly equivalent class looks like this. Yeah, that's all of it. So um, we we use the word data before the word class in Kotlin um, to say uh, basically write all of that code that we saw on those previous slides for me. So this is a good example of a pattern we found that works in Java and Kotlin makes it easy to follow that pattern and that, that actually means we're much less likely to make mistakes in our implementation. Who knows whether our hash code was correct? Um, who knows whether our equals function we swapped something around or accidentally copied and pasted so we were checking desk twice and never checking name or vice versa. Um, so when the code is just created for us under the under the hood um, we can trust that Kotlin is creating it correctly um, and it's pretty much always that you know it's what is correct is pretty much always obvious in this kind of case so it's not like we're going to need Kotlin to do it some other way for us. Um, so this is this is Kotlin really making us able to express what we mean. This is a an object which has a property called name. We only say the word name once, uh, and we get all of that stuff done for us. By the way, all these examples that I'm showing you, I've written what I hope is a comprehensive set of unit tests that are identical between the Kotlin and Java versions, um, and all the tests still pass. So I have got unit tests for this tiny little Kotlin class that check all the things like the hash codes are the same when the objects are the same and that equals gives the right answer and, uh, and so on and so on. Um, so you even get setter and getter methods in Kotlin, although interestingly in Kotlin you don't call it get name, even though if you translate that code into Java and call it from Java there is a function there called get name, but when you're writing Kotlin code you just say dot name and it knows that actually it's calling the getter get name underneath in some sense. Um, look into that more if you if that confused you. Okay, so other things. Well, uh, let's take another example of some Java code. This again is an example taken from um, some real code and then um, massaged enormously. Um, and it, it, I'm going to have to explain a little bit about a pattern that I'm following it, uh, when I wrote this code. So this is a class called message. It has a number of properties: ID, customer, to, from, body. So this is like a message being sent from one person to another person by a customer. Um, and uh, most of those properties are uh, optional, except for ID, which is mandatory. So you can see there's a constructor which takes in the ID, uh, and that's the only constructor there is. Uh, and then if you want to make uh, a message that has an ID but also has customer set on it, what you do is you call a constructor with an ID, and then you call dot for customer. And what for customer does is actually returns a new message, which is a modified version of the um, the message you had before. So it's, it's a bit like a builder pattern, except I super hate the builder pattern because, well, let's go through that slightly. So the builder pattern involves writing two classes instead of one, and in order to make your main class immutable, you write this horrifically, incredibly mutatable class called builder, which is like a copy of all the code in your other class, except it's mutable. So I prefer to follow this pattern, where we've got a genuinely immutable object, but we can use instances of that object to build other instances um, with different properties. So, for example, if we want to build a message with a two and a customer, we create a message with its ID, and then we call dot with two, and then we call dot for customer, and we end up with a message which has that ID and that two and that customer. Anyway, that's how I write some of my Java code when I'm feeling particularly uh, annoyed with the builder pattern. Um, uh, and I don't want to have 17 different uh, constructors that all take different arguments and somehow you can distinguish between them. 
perhaps 17 different static methods that have actual names that describe what they do, that take different combinations of the optional arguments, which could be a nice way to do things if they weren't all optional like they are in this case. Uh, anyway, so that's um, that's how I'd write this code in Java to make this message. Um, but what I can write in Kotlin is something that looks like this. So again, this is a data class, so we get all of the equals and hash code and stuff for free. Uh, but that's not what we're focusing on here. What we're focusing on here is that uh, I, while ID is just listed as a string, um, customer, for example, is listed with this equals null, which means um, if you don't provide the customer when you call this constructor, it will be set to null, and if you do provide um, the customer, um, then it will be set um, as the property of the message. So here's how we would construct a message. Um, you can, by the way, say id equals there if you want to, um, but I didn't bother. So this is exactly constructing a message which has an id and a two and a customer, and the other stuff is null because it's been left out. Um, but instead of me writing my own weird dialect of Java with these um, with customer things or using a builder, which I hate, um, it's just a direct expression of exactly what I meant, which is construct the subject with these um, things being passed in and other stuff being left out. Um, if you've done any Python or many other languages, um, you'll be very familiar with the way this works. Uh, it's more likely to be correct than one following these one one of these other patterns, I assert. Um, it doesn't only work for constructors, by the way. This is just the example I was using. So you, you can have um, default arguments and named arguments when you're calling any type of method, not just a constructor method. Uh, it's just a really good way of expressing what you meant, I feel. Um, next example. So imagine that we are building a class. By the way, when I wrote this example, I didn't think that actually this is a bit of a creepy thing to do. So we don't actually do this to our customers. I kind of, I took this class and I completely remodeled it into something else. And afterwards I thought, uh, oh, um, this is a creepy thing to do, but we don't really do it. So imagine we had a class uh, where we were keeping track of how valuable our customers were by scoring them. Uh, and the way we score them is um, looking at what, uh, what, um, things they're searching for on our website and giving them points based on which um, which words they use. So for here, for example, if they search for amethyst, they must be a very valuable customer. If they search for purple, not so valuable. Um, so actually, all, all we're doing here uh, in this beginning bit of the class is constructing a map from a word to value, or from a number to from a string to a number. Um, so this is one way you might construct that map in Java with this horrible static block. There are other ways, none of them nice. Um, uh, and then when we actually uh, scoring a customer, we would do it like this. So we have a map um, called scores, which is from um, the username of the customer to their current score. And then when a request comes in on a, on a certain path, that path could be one of those words like amethyst. Uh, we score the request by essentially updating this map scores um, by saying that user should get whatever score they currently had plus the score they get for this word that, that we're looking up. Um, by the way, this merge method isn't that cool. Um, I, I didn't know about it until I started um, hacking around with this example to make it look the way I thought it should. Uh, it's a cool little method, but it means exactly what I said. Um, just update the entry for a user um, with the value that I'm giving you, which is that word values.getPath. So that's telling us, like, uh, what was it, 3 for purple or 50 for amethyst. Uh, and the way you update the entry for user is to is you add to it. That's what integer colon colon sum means. Uh, add it to what was already there, or if there was nothing there, just use what's, what I'm giving you. So essentially we're saying add on to the... Um, customer's score, the new score for this request. Um, and then later on we can ask um, what's the total score for this user at this time by calling that total method. So that's a little bit of Java. Um, here's a test for that Java. Um, and we can, we're basically making a scorer and then scoring some requests and we're trying to make some assertions about um, what the user's score was at the end. But 
uh, we actually crash on the line that's highlighted there. So can you figure out why we crash? Well, the answer is we've misspelled lavender. Um, and what that means, let's go back, what that means is that when we get to the, the line with some red highlighting here, um, we're actually going to crash because word values dot get lavender but misspelt returns null. So um, without any of our code mentioning nulls anywhere, we've ended up with a null pointer that we're then trying to add on to something, um, or uh, yeah, to, we're then trying to add on to something, but you can't add on a null to anything, so. Um, we throw. So we didn't mention null in our program, and yet we've, uh, our program has failed with a null pointer exception, because get returns null if you can't find that word. So uh, let's have a look at our Kotlin equivalent of this code. So first of all, building a map. So this is the way you build a map in Kotlin. Uh, that weird word too can be quite confusing, but it essentially means uh, purple, lavender, and amethyst are the um, left-hand side of the map, and those, those numbers are the right-hand side. If you don't like that, you can just make a pair object instead of saying two. Um, I find that weird, I must admit. I would rather it was some kind of arrow or something like in other languages. But uh, would I really? Because actually I quite like English words for things. So I don't know. Maybe I'll just get used to it. Anyway, you've got to admit it's better than the, the Java where we had that weird static block. Although there are other ways of doing it, but I don't. as I said, I don't like any of them. Um, and then here we're making scores, which by the way is a mutable map um, of string to integer and uh, word values was just a map, so it's actually immutable. Again, Kotlin having things immutable by default and we can have this map be immutable because it never changes, so isn't that cool? Now we know it never changes and the compiler will enforce that for us, find our errors early. I think that's cool. Um, but yeah, scores can change, so that's why it's a mutable, a mutable map. <coughs> and here's our score request function. Again, we're using merge, so we're using the same, um, actually the same class that we were using in Java to for our map, um, but also um, the same merge method that we've seen before. And this time, well, before we were calling word values dot get path, this time we're using the square bracket operator, but it essentially means the same thing as word values dot get uh, in Java. But this is how you write it in Kotlin with the square bracket operator. Because in Kotlin you're allowed to overload operators. Um, but notice um, that there is a little extra bit of code in the Kotlin that is not in the Java. And this is mandatory. You're not allowed to just type word values brackets path um, because the return value of that square bracket operator might be null. It might be a number or it might be null. And in Kotlin, uh, code, uh, the compiler keeps track of whether or not a value might be null and it doesn't let you pass a value that might be null into a method that requires something to be not null. So in this case merge requires that um, the thing you pass into it can't be null. So the compiler will uh, object if you try and uh, write code that doesn't deal with that. Um, so this, this example is not just an example of the fact that Kotlin makes you deal with it but also that sometimes the way you deal with it can be quite small, not much code. So for example here we're using the so-called Elvis operator, because if you tip your head on one side, uh, the question mark colon kind of looks like Elvis. And what that means is either use that value on the left or if that value is null, use this value instead, and in this case zero. So what we're essentially saying is look up in the word values app, uh, this path that we've been given, if it's not there, just use zero. If it is there, use what's in the map. And actually, uh, zero might not be the right answer. I think it probably is the right answer in this case. If, you, if it's a word we don't know about, you probably don't want any score for it. Um, but yeah, the, you don't have to use the Elvis operator. You can write a whole load of code to handle that null. And the Kotlin, Kotlin will track whether or not you have handled nullness um, for you. And then, if so if you're inside some kind of if block which checks for nullness, Kotlin won't tell you you've done wrong by not checking for null because it can see it can figure that out. Um, or you can write really quite concise little bits of code like this, um, which just handle the null case in a way that once you get used to reading it, it's quite easy to read. Not too much extra noise in the syntax, but boy, do you get a lot of extra safety in your code um, without these null pointer exceptions flying up in your face without you ever even thinking they might happen. 
Um, and I must say, if this was the only thing Kotlin gave you, um, I still think it might be worth switching to Kotlin for it. Uh, it is such peace of mind to know um, that all those nulls that might be flying around in your Java code are not flying around in your Kotlin code. They've been handled, um, or they haven't been handled, and you're explicitly saying this might be null. Okay, other things. So let's have a look at uh, a function. Um, it, as we go through these um, examples, get more complicated. So I, I, apologize, I don't apologize for that, but you're just going to have to gradually engage your brain more and more. Okay, so or you have to believe me more and more. Um, so here's an example of a more complicated function, which is slightly culled um, from some of our real code, and obviously all the names change to protect the guilty. Um, but this is a function that handles a message, maybe one of those messages that we saw in the previous example. Uh, and what it does it, it eventually is it emits some kind of um, event um, because the message came in. Um, but the question for you is, what is the bug in this code? By the way, I'm fairly sure this is a real bug that we found at some point in our code. I hacked it into this example. Um, but the bug, as I'm sure you realized, is that the start variable gets used for two different things. Uh, it gets declared at the top and it gets set to the time, uh, current time, and then at the end we're trying to use it to figure out how long the whole thing took by doing end minus start. But in the middle we've set start to zero, um, so actually that time that we print out um, towards the end is going to be the uh, amount of time since 1970 minus two milliseconds or something like that, three milliseconds, um, because start got modified by that loop in the middle. So that's a bug. There it is. But we can, uh, we can make that bug visible to the compiler if we change the declaration of start at the top there to add this special word, final, which means start will never change. Um, and because we said that, the compiler will give us an error on the line that's gone red saying, you said this variable will never change. Um, but then you changed it. So by the way, just as a little hint, uh, if you've got to handle deal with some great long method with a whole load of rubbish in it like this um, and you're trying to pick it apart maybe refactor it into smaller code that you can understand better um, one way of kind of identifying how how that function works is to try scattering final around here here and there um, see what variables actually never change um, things like that and possibly catching a bug like this while you're at it or possibly spending hours puzzling over how on earth that variable is used for two things and realizing they didn't mean that. Um, yeah, anyway, so the compiler can help you. Um, so if we do the similar type of stuff in Kotlin, we might write a function like this. So in this case, we've declared um, start and end at the top just like we did before. By the way, I think that's terrible practice, and I would much rather declare the variable immediately at the moment when I use it, so I know it's what it's going to get initialized to. But I didn't refactor that um, that pattern that I don't like out of this code in order to make this example a bit more realistic. Anyway, here's our Kotlin equivalent code, and you notice the word val, which um, uh, is the kind of default way of making, of naming a, 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 a value in Kotlin code. I'm, I'm trying to avoid using the word variable because it can't vary, because what val means is that um, it never changes. So when I constructed this example, I expected Kotlin to tell me about my error um, in a very similar way to Java, to tell me, oh, you, you declared it as a val, uh, and then you tried to change it. Interestingly, uh, for this particular example, that would happen in some examples. Uh, often, using val is basically equivalent of typing fi final. Um, in fact, it is the equivalent of typing final. Um, but in this case, Kotlin, one of other, Kotlin's other rules came along and uh, made the behavior slightly different from what I was expecting, which is that actually... In a for loop, uh, Kotlin starts a new scope and uses and do, and makes sure that that start variable that we're typing there is is only declared inside that um, the, the scope of that loop. So actually, this code would work perfectly. So we by switching from Java to Kotlin, we got this subtle change in behavior. Maybe a worry, um, but it's subtle change in behavior that actually made uh, the intention of what we wrote correct. Whereas before it. it or rather, the correctly implements the intention of our code, whereas before it didn't. Um, anyway, they, it, uh, it does that, but it also warns us. Uh, the compiler uh, emits a warning saying the name was shadow because it's probably not what you meant to have another variable with exactly the same name in the same scope. 
interestingly in Rust, that is a normal pattern and a good thing to do, but um, in Kotlin obviously it's not because it gives you a warning. Um, and in general I can understand why not, because it seems dangerous, at least in the way it's happening here. Harder to understand. Uh, in Rust it kind of overwrites and never comes back, I think, which is probably fine. Anyway, that's a slight diversion. Uh, yeah, so what's the point? The point is, the default way of writing code in Kotlin with val um, is equivalent to this very verbose thing that no one ever types in Java, which is final int blah. Um, and it means um, this variable doesn't change. And then if you actually realize that you do need your variable to change, you go up, you go back up to where you were, and you type var instead. So the default behavior of typing val, at least I hope, I hope that is going to be the default behavior of people writing Kotlin code, um, is the sanest one, the best, the best place to start. And then if you want to deviate from that and start doing things with mutability, uh, you have to go back and change it to var. So if you're writing Kotlin code, please make what I just said true and make everything a val until you realize you need a var. Okay, uh, now a bit of classic code um, from my company. Um, this is the kind of um, telecom style code. We've got um, something's happened. We've got an error code or a status code and we're going to behave differently based on uh, the code that we got back. Uh, and often we'll see code that looks like it would be more at home in a C code base than Java, but here it is in a Java code base. Um, and essentially what we're doing here is we're trying to determine uh, when we're going to reattempt sending this message. We're either going to, um, based on some of the codes, we're going to do it in one hour times the number of tries we've already done uh, from now. In some case, some error codes, we're going to do it in one minute after now. And in some cases, we're not going to reattempt this message at all, maybe because it failed in a permanent way or even succeeded. That can happen. So that, that's the way you handle cases in Java. You write a switch statement. And you need to remember to put your break statements in the places where you need break statements and not put break statements in places where you don't need break statements. And again, I've tried to write this code in a, a way that's like good Java, not so not to be too unfair to Java. Um, so there's no fall through, like do some code and then fall through um, or stuff like that, which can be quite confusing. Uh, the only fall through we're using in this case statement is grouping together multiple cases that are all identically handled. The, I did, something I did leave in is that this code um, follows this pattern which you might or might not like of not returning until the end. Uh, personally I think there were good reasons why people started doing that but I, I don't think it's a pattern we should follow um, but I left it in. Uh, here's the Kotlin that does the exact equivalent of that code. Um, so it's a when statement um, and then you can have multiple cases separated by commas and then the right hand side is the value that you get out at the end. Uh, and there's a few other things to say about this. Yeah, let's say it now. Um, so first of all, notice that um, it is a single return, but it, it but we're returning the value of a when statement rather than um, inside each case returning a value and having to remember to do that in each case or something like that, or or as we did in the previous code, setting a value which we then return right at the end. In Kotlin, an if statement and also a when statement is an expression, so it's something that you can return itself. It doesn't just execute code, it's act it actually produces a value. Uh, and in this case the value is the thing that's on the right hand side of the of the little arrow symbols. Um, and when you return them as an expression, you need to have an else case, or you need to have handled all the possible cases. So in the case of a number like this, you're definitely going to need an else case. Um, uh, yeah, so whenever you're using a, a value like that and you know that you've got to get something out of it, the Kotlin's compiler will um, ensure that you covered every possible case and you always you always explicitly say some value. So you can't forget the default case is what I'm getting at. Um, so for me, this code really directly expresses what I meant. And therefore, it's harder for me to make mistakes. And notice I can't miss out a break uh, because there is no break. Each case is separate. Um, there's no fall through. Fall through is sometimes cool. Is it worth the tax we pay of being really hard to understand? No. Um, okay, and then also we can go further than that by saying 
um, actually, probably what we were doing there wasn't really expressing what we meant uh, fully, and maybe what we really meant was something um, like the bottom half of this, the code here, which is basically, if it's a slow error, then do the slow thing, if it's a fast error, do the fast thing, if it's fatal, do nothing, something like that. So, in this case, um, we're we, we've made a bunch of classes which we're then asking, is it an instance of slow error, is it an instance of fast error, and so on. Um, and as I was saying, the Kotlin compiler makes sure that you cover all the cases um, when you're returning a value like this, um, but you'll notice that there's no else case. And the reason there's no else case is because the Kotlin compiler knows that we have handled um, all the cases because we did this thing at the top of calling response a sealed class and response is the base class of all these other classes what that means is i promise and the compiler enforces that um, all the subclasses of this class that there are ever going to be are all defined inside this file this dot kt file um, so when you say sealed class like that it means all the subclasses are going to be defined inside this file and there will be no more what that mean, what that means is the compiler can check that have you actually mentioned them all because it knows there's this finite list of possible subclasses so this is a little bit like an algebraic data class or um, like an enum on steroids type class um, that you might see in other languages <clears throat> so it gives us a way of saying these are all the possible cases in a kind of object oriented world which is quite nice uh, yeah, and then as I said before, um, we can return this whole thing as an expression, uh, and that to me is a more declarative way of doing it. And rather than saying uh, switch on all these cases, and if this happens, then return this, and if this happens, then return this, you can see that that's a kind of uh, telling you what to do type style, whereas this is more of a telling you what things are type style, which I prefer. I think it's uh, closer to what I really meant. Okay, so more stuff. Uh, here's another example. This is a class called a requester, and a uh, requester can be constructed in multiple ways. So we've got this constructor at the top where we pass in a scheme like uh, HTTP, uh, and then a host name, and, and then uh, an HTTP client, as in uh, a class which is able to make HTTP requests. So you'll notice that there's a um, constructor at the top, like I described, but there's also a couple of other constructors. One of them um, uh, takes in a username and a password and a host and um, this boolean um, argument for uh, should you use SSL and then another and then that calls the third constructor and the third constructor um, oh, yeah. the third constructor uh, also takes in use SSL um, but doesn't take in username and password um, and then based on whether you said you wanted to use SSL or not, it, it either provides HTTPS or HTTP as the scheme, and then it calls the constructor at the top. So there's, a, there's three constructors, um, and they, they call each other, and they all end up actually calling the one at the top. Um, one of them makes, makes, your, makes its own HTTP client for you, and the others you have to pass in an HTTP client from outside. So different ways of constructing this object, but you always end up with... Um, a similar looking object at the end. Um, so this this class is constructed in a way that I often try and construct my classes. I, sometimes I just think you should just only ever have one constructor. What on earth are you doing having multiple of them? How on earth are you going to know what state your object is in if you have multiple constructors? But when I allow myself to use, create multiple constructors, because there's some good reason that I can't escape, I really, really try to have one kind of main constructor that kind of expresses what the object is, um, and other constructors that are just other ways of making one of them. And interestingly, what Kotlin does is enforces that pattern. So that was a pattern that was kind of half present in my mind. It was kind of, I was trying to get to something. And when I started reading the way Kotlin does constructors, I realized that the way Kotlin does it is actually what I'd been kind of trying to ease my brain towards gradually over the years. So what it has is a main constructor, which is the green one at the top, um, which is up right next to the word class. So that's a kind of, in a way, that's like a definition of the object, because those val, the word val before each of those actually means this is not just a constructor argument, it's also a field in the, um, in the class. If you miss out val, then you, um, you 
then it, those things are not fields of the class and you have to create other fields, set other fields for it, which you can do. Um, but in this case, the three, those three things, uh, scheme, host and client, are fields as well as constructor arguments for that main constructor at the top. And then there's two other constructors which are declared with the word constructor below. And those are kind of secondary. They're not the, the primary one. They're constructors which must end up calling that main constructor at the top once they've done whatever other work they're doing. So it actually enforces this structure that I was um, kind of trying to make sure was enforced in my Java code or make sure was followed in my Java code, Kotlin actually enforces that pattern. That there's one constructor that in some sense expresses what this object really is, and then other constructors that can build one of them in different ways. Um, but that main constructor tells you this is this is what one of these objects really looks like. And yeah, so I, the, I really like this pattern. It might be a bit weird for you if it's the first time you're seeing it. You might think, well, actually, that's not going to fit what I'm doing. But... Um, I would encourage you to think carefully about what you're doing. It maybe does fit what you're doing, or maybe your object isn't really an object, it's actually two objects if it doesn't, because in some sense that primary constructor expresses the fundamental nature of that object. Like how you can make an object is a lot of information about what that object is. I also find that primary one is the one that's often needed when I'm writing tests, because it's the one that could take in directly an HTTP client, for example, and in a test, I would be passing in some kind of mock or fake HTTP client. Um, so I'm going to need that constructor to be visible. Sometimes that kind of fundamental constructor like that um, is hidden in your Java code. It doesn't even exist, or it's private or something like that. And you need to make it public for tests. So in some sense, letting that fundamental nature of the object be visible in this primary constructor uh, nudges towards a style, a more testable style, maybe. At least it fits for me uh, with a style that I was already getting to, partly driven by tests. Uh, yeah, so that was what one's one that I think you need to think more carefully about to decide whether you really like it or not. But having thought about it a bit myself, I'm definitely coming down the side of, yeah, this is really good to be clear. Uh, one of the constructors is the real one in some sense. Other things. Okay, so completely different topic. Uh, here's some code. Uh, very massively hacked from some real code, um, probably maybe just even made up. Uh, and it uses some um, streams. Uh, and what it does is um, it has a list of um, drinks which are hot at the top, and then it has a method to find out which customers are hot. And what it does is it looks through all the customers, um, filters them out so that only the ones whose um, whose drink, because a customer has a, a field in it called drink, uh, anyone whose drink contains one of the hot drinks is a hot customer. So we filter out so only customers whose drink contains a word from one of those hot drinks at the top. And then we call map to say, give me the name of that customer. And then we collect the answer into a list. So that's the way you write some code to give me a list of all the hot customers in Java. Uh, have you noticed that there's some stuff here highlighted in red? Now, why do you think I've highlighted that in red? Well, perhaps because if we switch to the Kotlin version, the red words disappear. Let's switch back again. So what those red words are for is to distract you, confuse you, and make it really, really hard for you to uh, write stream code. So when we, when we go to Kotlin, uh, we can write code that looks really similar, but without all those red words. Now let's look back at it. So recently I've been doing a little bit of interviewing um, programmers for jobs and what I found um, uh, often when you give someone like a, a toy problem in an interview, I often we've been doing the kind of um, you know here's a little programming problem um, just to talk us through how you would solve that and then actually solve it with a, um, an IDE uh, a computer and a keyboard and stuff like that, not on a whiteboard, I might point out. Um, you know, how would you solve this little problem? Often that kind of problem de deals with things like lists and maps and things like that. So often you can see the thought process in the candidate's face where they think, oh, that's, uh, that's a listy type thing. I should definitely use streams. They're not going to look really good. And what they do is they write a little bit of code, some like something near the top of this 
um, that method, that hot customers method, you know, they write customers.stream and they think, oh, I should probably filter it. And they're definitely going along the right lines. And then they get somewhere further down and then they get to the, oh, and then I need to collect this. And then who can remember what collector you use or how collectors work? Um, and then they give up and they write a for loop and it's three lines of code and it works perfectly and, you know, they get the job. But the point is, what on earth is going on? Especially, I mean, the dot stream is, you know, horrible, but it's kind of necessary for the way, I don't know, isn't it? Is it? Is it necessary? I don't know. It's horrible. Um, and then that whole collector thing, oh boy. I mean, it's explicit, you know, exactly what you're doing, but... Uh, oh, well, having used languages where you don't have to do that, having to do that makes it really hard. And one of the points of street writing code of streams is that it's really clear and, uh, and simple. It makes it clear what how, how data is flowing through the code. And when you've got all this um, red stuff everywhere, it's not clear. You can't see what's going on. Anyway, you don't have to write any of that red stuff in Kotlin. It has streams that look a bit like this. Or in this case, exactly like this. Um, so we just say, give me the customers, filter them based on this um, little lambda function, uh, which basically is saying, um, <clears throat> um, it, it, for any of the hot drinks, does the customer's drink contain that hot drink? And then map it to the customer's name. So just give me the, uh, given that I filtered out only the customers I want, now give me their names. And there's no collect, there's no dot stream. Um, it's a little bit more chance that you'll actually understand what's going on here. Um, notice that it uses, um, for its closures or um, uh, lambda functions, um, there's this variable called it. So cust.drink.contains brackets it. So what that is, is that if you've got a lambda function, which uh, only takes one argument, if you just use the word it, Kotlin knows that you mean um, the argument without you having to do any of that um, argument name arrow and then some code business so you might like that you might not like that but it does make um, these very small lambda functions especially like if you look at the one on the last line it does make them very concise by the way you can say customer colon colon name there just like in the Java um, but I think it looks nicer to use it dot name the little use the little lambda function there so streams look better I argue Okay, so that was my last example. Uh, so here's my summary of things about Kotlin. Um, there are lots and lots of patterns that we try to follow in Java because it makes it easier um, to to use the code. It makes it makes it clear, and it's the way people generally do things. Now, obviously, there are some patterns in Java that we hate and don't want to do, um, but hopefully, they, what Kotlin does is for the patterns that we love and do want to do or at least tolerate and do want to do, um, it makes it easy to do those patterns without having to do loads and loads of typing, which you, all have, you have to get all right. Um, makes it easy to do things uh, the way you would want to do it. For example, those data classes or making making little value objects that just represent something with two properties. Very easy with data class. Um, generally, making your variables immutable unless they need to change. Uh, it's just easy to do in Kotlin and slightly annoying to do in Java. Uh, writing code with streams, easy to do in Kotlin and much harder to do in Java, especially that collect business. Um, other things like just constructing things, uh, having default arguments, um, having a cl this clarity around construction. It's easy to do things in a, w in a way that I feel is a good way, the right way. Um, secondly, null, uh, handling nulls is mandatory. And when you do it, you have to be explicit about what am I doing here. Um, you, there is actually a way of saying, I don't care. I know that this might be null, but just pretend that it never will be and throw if it is. Uh, and you say that by adding an exclamation mark, which looks really awful. It makes you feel bad. Um, and that's good too. But yeah, that's explicit too. And as in the example that I showed, hopefully, you can see that it's also quite easy and doesn't take up a huge amount of code uh, to handle um, and all this and just do the right thing like for example with the Elvis operator and there's a few other um, bits and bobs that make dealing with that pretty easy also it helps you to say what you mean for example um, case expressions are just I think much closer to what I really meant uh, and returning return if and return when um, 
uh, basically um, it, having those to be expressions that you can return or use um, rather than just being prescriptions of um, what to do when makes means that you are allowed to have a more declarative style there's other examples of that too for example just being encouraged to use streams I would consider also to be a more declarative style uh, so that was my summary of things. Um, uh, just as a little bonus, things that I would like just to make Kotlin a little bit closer to being uh, the language I would love to work with. I would li really love a way of saying uh, this function is pure. What I mean by pure is um, it doesn't change any of the stuff that got passed into it um, and it doesn't change anything else in the outside world. Um, if I had functions that I knew were absolutely pure, that would open up a whole load of stuff. Not only um, would it mean that uh, it would catch mistakes I make when I when I meant something to be pure? It wasn't. Um, but potentially more importantly, it means I can do all kinds of cool stuff with multi-threading where I, I know for sure functions aren't going to affect anything outside of their own stuff. So I can run as many of them in parallel as I want to and just throw them onto some kind of thread pool and they run. Wouldn't that be cool? If the compiler could check for me, yeah, that's definitely pure. So you can definitely... Um, run that whenever you like and it will always give you back the same answer for the same input. Secondly, I would like something that's a lot more um, than just final or val in Kotlin speak. I want to be able to say a variable, um, not just that the variable itself won't change, but none of the stuff inside it will change. So I want some kind of constantness or immutability that goes really deep that says uh, this object is going to look exactly the same next time I look at it. No one's gone in and fiddled with one of its properties or anything like that. Not just that I've got the same variable uh, or I'm pointing to the same um, thing in memory, but actually that thing hasn't changed at all because it can't. I'd love to have that kind of deep freeze immutability. I believe you have that in Kotlin native, um, but not when you're compiling for the JVM. Uh, so yeah, wouldn't that be cool? And that's it. So uh, if you want to find more videos like this, have a look for them on uh, YouTube uh, under the username AJ Balaam or um, have a look on uh, my, uh, the Peertube instance that I'm using, which is peertube.mastodon.host. Um, um, so that's got quite a lot of my YouTube videos and I'll be putting more on over time. Uh, that's an alternative to YouTube, which um, uh, is not controlled by a single entity. Um, and there's some cool stuff appearing on there. Um, yeah, be be aware that it's not censored, um, so some caution needed, but um, my videos, you can be pretty sure, are going to be fairly appropriate. Um, also, you can find me on social media, at Andy Balaam, or, or on Twitter, or at Andy Balaam at Mastodon.social, a new cool social network uh, that's like Twitter, but not controlled by anyone. Um, where, by the way, you can follow Peertube accounts as well, if you want to, because it's all everyone all working together in a cool way. Um, you can find my blog at artificialworlds.net slash blog or my open source project stuff like that artificialworlds.net find some of the code and presentations and videos that I've created on GitHub and GitLab under that username Andy Balaam play my game Rabbit Escape look for it on the Google Play Store uh, or look for it on artificialworlds.net slash rabbit dash escape um, it's a cool little game inspired by Lemmings um, but hopefully nicer to use on a mobile device. Also works on PC, Mac, uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows. Um, but it's also, but yeah, it's um, uh, hopefully good for a phone. Certainly good on a tablet. Um, it's all done completely open source. You're going to really enjoy it. Um, if you would like to uh, donate to support these videos, have a look for Patreon, Andy Balaam on Patreon, and see you next time.